There are five fundamental operations of mathematics – addition, subtraction, multiplication, division and modular forms. This quote, often attributed to Martin Eichler, doesn't fail to highlight the importance of modular forms in math. They are an incredibly powerful tool and perhaps their most famous application is the proof of Fermat's last theorem after centuries. Other fields where they show up are formulas we use to calculate pi to billions of digits or the optimal packing of eight-dimensional spheres. Nevertheless, it's likely that the only thing you heard about modular forms is how useful they are and how symmetric they are. At least that's all I knew before I began with my research. In this video, I want to show you a bit more of what modular forms really are. The formal definition of a modular form is that it's a function satisfying the following three conditions. First, that it is holomorphic, which essentially means differentiable but for complex numbers. But the other two conditions really make you wonder what their purpose even is. To explain this, let's start with a seemingly unrelated topic, lattices. Take two numbers on the complex plane, omega 1 and omega 2. When working with the complex plane, I will use numbers, points and vectors interchangeably. You may take any two numbers as long as they are linearly independent, which means they don't lie on the same line through the origin. Now, take all integer multiples of omega 1. You can then shift these points by integer multiples of omega 2 to get a lattice. Every such pair of complex numbers defines a lattice like that. But is every lattice uniquely defined by two complex numbers? Try it yourself. Find two different vectors that describe the same lattice as the one shown here. One example would be 1 minus 2i and minus 2 minus i. The lattice spanned by these two is the exact same as the one from before. The transformation between these two bases can be described by a matrix. In this case, this number is minus 1 times omega 1 plus 0 times omega 2, while this number is minus 1 times omega 1 plus minus 1 times omega 2. You can see that both basis vectors of our new base lie on lattice points of the old one. They are a combination of integer multiples of omega 1 and omega 2. This matches the fact that all entries of our matrix are integers. And since both bases define the same lattice, the inverse of the matrix would be how the first basis can be described in terms of the second, and its entries should of course be integers as well. The set of these matrices for its own is interesting enough that it has a special name. GL2 of Z, which stands for General Linear Group, integer matrices whose inverse is an integer matrix as well. The determinant of such matrices must be plus or minus 1, think about that. A quick side note about elliptic functions. If you now have a lattice, an elliptic function on this lattice is a function which is periodic with respect to the lattice. Take a basis of your lattice and draw a parallelogram through the origin and the two basis vectors. You can now cover the entire complex plane with these tiles. And periodic with respect to the lattice means now that the value of this elliptic function is the same in each parallelogram. When visualizing a complex function like this, we have a two-dimensional input and a two-dimensional output. To visualize the entire function, each point on the complex plane is color-coded according to its output. These are the color codes associated with each output value. At zero, it's black and goes to white approaching infinity. The hue indicates the argument of the number. The connection between elliptic functions and modular forms is the key part of the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Now, a modular form is essentially a function that assigns each lattice a complex number. Let's take a function g. It takes a lattice as an input and outputs a complex number. And instead of a lattice, we can write its input as a base omega 1 and omega 2 of the lattice. Now it will be very helpful later to have g homogeneous, so rescaling the lattice by some factor only rescales the output of g by a power of this factor. After all, rescaled lattices are very similar. If this exponent k is 0, the output of g doesn't change whether the lattice is rescaled or not. This would be the ideal condition and leads to the so-called modular functions, not to be confused with modular forms. Other than that, we call k the weight of the modular form, 
Obviously, choosing a different base of the lattice shouldn't change the output of G, so we formalize this as a second condition on G. For a matrix A, B, C, D in GL2 of Z, applying it to omega 1, omega 2 gives us a new base A omega 1 plus B omega 2 and C omega 1 plus D omega 2. G of this base should obviously evaluate to the same as G of the original base, as both bases describe the exact same lattice. Now, working with two inputs is not too great. Ideally, we'd want a function with one input and one output. Luckily, there's a solution. We define the function f of tau as g of tau and 1. This is just g of omega 1 and omega 2, rescaled by 1 over omega 2, where tau is omega 1 divided by omega 2. Now you can see why it's useful for g to be homogeneous. This corresponds to rotating and scaling the lattice of omega 1 and omega 2, so that omega 2 ends up at 1. Another restriction we want to make is that tau should be on the upper half plane. We can do this because if omega 1 divided by omega 2 has an imaginary part less than 0, we just define tau as negative omega 1 divided by omega 2. But restricting tau to be positive in turn restricts our choices for the matrices for basis transformation. Think about it. Some matrices leave tau positive, while some switch the sign of omega 1 divided by omega 2 and therefore make tau negative. The answer is that matrices with a positive determinant don't change the sign of tau. Our determinant is already plus or minus 1, so we're going to restrict it to be just 1. And the general linear group becomes the special linear group. Our equations can now be rewritten like this. This is the second condition for modular form the so-called modularity condition, and it's what truly defines a modular form. We are now almost at the textbook definition of a modular form. If the weight is zero, this is called a modular function and we are done. But for a non-zero weight, there's one third technical restriction and we'll get to it later. One thing to keep in mind is that this weight must be an even number. This is because this matrix, minus one, zero, zero, minus one, already breaks the equation for all odd integers. The only thing left would be constant functions, and those are not particularly interesting. Now we've seen that the key property of a modular form is that it satisfies a certain function equation with respect to the group action of the modular group. You already know the equation of this property. Essentially, the modular group is the group SR2 of Z. We discovered it as all transformations of a basis of a lattice that leaves the lattice the same. Additionally, the determinant of the matrix of this transformation is 1, which keeps tau in the upper half plane. But what is a group, or even a group action? A group is a set of elements with one associative operation. In our case, this operation is matrix multiplication. Every element has an inverse, which is just the inverse matrix here. And there's a neutral element. In this case, that's the identity matrix. Now there is something called a group action of the modular group on the upper half plane. This lets us define how members of our group act on elements of totally different sets, like matrices can operate on vectors. Here, this maps every tau to a tau plus b over c tau plus d, which is in fact a special kind of a Möbius transformation. This transformation shows up in the function equation of our modular form, which allows us to use group theory for further investigations. Now even an infinite group like this one may have a structure such that only a few of the elements are enough to generate the whole group. And that's precisely the case for the modular group. Can you think of some elements of this group that, when chained together in an arbitrary way, can give us every element of the group? Well, you can prove that the entirety of the modular group is generated by only two elements, S and T. Combining these two matrices and their inverses, we can get every single element of the modular group. So, for example, our transformation from earlier, with the matrix minus 1, minus 1, 0, minus 1, is s squared times t. The group actions of these two matrices, s and t, are very simple, as you can see. Translation and inversion plus mirroring. This massively simplifies the function equation for modular forms. Instead of having to consider every matrix a, b, c, d, we only need to check a function on s and t. For t, we get that the function must be periodic, with period 1. For s, we get this equation containing the weight k. Remember, a modular form only has to satisfy these two equations. Now, one consequence of these symmetries is that 
For a modular form, we essentially only need to know its values in the so-called fundamental domain, located here on the complex plane. Remember? We initially saw that modular forms act on lattices, so every point on the fundamental domain corresponds to a lattice. For example, our lattice from earlier corresponds to this point here, where tau was. By the first symmetry, we know that shifting this stripe to the right or left by 1 gives the exact same values. And the second symmetry, mirroring at the unit circle and the y-axis, gives us information about the function in these places. Of course, this time the values have to be scaled according to the weight. We can repeat these two actions, shifting and mirroring, until the whole complex plane is filled. You can see that each of these separate parts corresponds to one matrix of the modular group. Now how would you actually write down such a function? Because the function is periodic, we can make use of yet another tool, Fourier series. This incredibly powerful tool can turn any periodic function into a composition of spinning vectors, represented by the complex exponential. I recommend checking out the excellent videos Free Blue One Brown made on the topic, but here's a short summary. We have a function which is periodic with a period of 1. That means, if you now take a point on the complex plane and another point, one to the right, the function must have the same value at both points. We will use a second complex plane to plot the values of the function. You can then draw a path between the two points and plot the outputs on all points on this path. This gives us a closed loop. And our Fourier series allows us to decompose such a loop into spinning vectors added together. You get one arrow that stays in place, one that spins once every period, one that spins twice every period, and so on. In a normal Fourier series you can also have arrows spinning in the opposite direction, but that's actually the third condition for modular forms. All arrows spin in the same direction. Every one of these spinning arrows can be represented by a complex exponential, now taking a time parameter going from 0 to 1. You can tweak the size and starting position of each arrow to get the Fourier series of a specific function. Rewriting the entire modular form as a Fourier series is called the Q expansions because for whatever reason you replace the term e to the 2 pi iz with a q, so the q term confusingly is a function of z itself. This q expansion is an extremely useful method of describing a modular form because we essentially get a polynomial. Most modular forms and functions you're going to see will be written down in this way. Now one of the most basic modular forms is the Eisenstein series, defined over a lattice. Replacing this lattice by tau like we did before, we get this. If you want, you can easily check that this in fact satisfies all three conditions for a modular form. Now we can write this as a Q expansion. I won't go into the details, but surprisingly this not only contains the Riemann zeta function, but also the weighted sum of the Weisers function, sigma. This hopefully gives you a taste of why modular forms could be so important in number theory. In practice, however, it's often more convenient to work with the rescaled version of G, the normalized Eisenstein series, because it has a constant term of 1. One final note on the actual amount of modular forms. The modular forms of weight k form a finite dimensional vector space. This means that you can find a finite amount of modular forms for each weight, for which all other modular forms are just linear combinations of them. And what's even more convenient is that this dimension is extremely low for low weights. For weights from 4 up to 10, this dimension is just 1, which means all modular forms of a weight in this range are just a scalar multiple of the normalized Eisenstein series. And this is probably a big reason of why mathematicians love modular forms so much. Now, there is certainly a lot more to tell about modular forms and functions. For example, how exactly they are used to prove Fermat's last theorem together with elliptic functions. Or the modular function j, for which the Q expansion not only has all integer coefficients, but the third coefficient is 196,884, one higher than the dimension of the space the famous monster group acts on. Turns out that this is not a coincidence and leads to a field called monstrous moonshine. So if you enjoyed this video, consider liking and subscribing and leaving me feedback in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.